that Stephanie and Dorothy can tell uh, the story more personally. Uh, Stephanie wrote the book. Uh, I've got it here. You can get it on Amazon. I encourage you to read, learn about uh, Booker T. Washington's friendship uh, with Julius Rosenwald that sparked the creation and partnership with communities across the South, almost 5,000 schools. Uh, great springtime summer reading. She also happens to be married to Rosenwald's great grandson and she will share a bit of her story in, in uh, coming to write that book. Um, Dorothy, like myself, uh, saw the film and was inspired. She was more inspired because she started the National Park Historic Park campaign that has been progressing over the past five years. So our format tonight is that first Stephanie will speak for about 15 minutes or so with some slides that I will show. She will then turn it over to Dorothy to talk uh, about the status of the campaign. Uh, not a fundraising campaign at this point, it's a public awareness and legislative campaign in the Congress. Interesting to hear uh, how she has been planning with an impressive board uh, to bring that to fruition. Uh, we hope to have at least 20, 25 minutes for questions. I have a few uh, prepped, but I'm happy to take yours in the chat. So feel free to uh, post them there as they come to you. Uh, I'll be the timekeeper and uh, enjoy. I will shift gears to presentation mode and uh, Stephanie, you can take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Debbie. Um, I loved those quotes. That quote about Julius Rosenwald is wonderful. Uh, and it really, it really is very descriptive of him. Um, when Julius Rosenwald died in 1932, it was front page news. He was well known as the president of Sears Roebuck, one of the country's most successful businesses, and as a philanthropist of note. And so it's a little surprising that today he's scarcely remembered, uh, despite the fact that he left a remarkable legacy. In some ways, Julius Rosenwald is an archetypal American story. His parents were Germ German Jewish immigrants to this country. His father started as a peddler and then went on to the clothing trade and ended up running a store in Springfield, Illinois where Julius was born in 1862, and he grew up in this house, next slide, um, across the street from Abraham Lincoln's home. Uh, he learned commerce working in his father's store and the tenets of Judaism with a handful of other children in the town's small reform community. Julius Rosenwald never graduated from high school. Uh, at 16, he went to New York to learn the wholesale side of the business and returned to Chicago to start his own company. Okay, let's see, young Julius. Um, in 1895, he had the opportunity to buy into a small, unknown mail order company called Sears Roebuck. And he later said it was the business of five minutes to decide that this was a business with a future, as indeed it was. And um, as Mr. Forbes comment pointed out that Julius was not exceptionally brilliant but one trait that made him successful both in business and later as a philanthropist was something very akin to brilliance. He was very open to ideas and advice from other people. And he was a team player. Once uh, a journalist coming out of Sears at closing time asked him, how does it feel to have all these people working for you? And Rosenwald said, well, I think of them as working with me. Um, so one of the people who was an early influence on Rosenwald, the next picture, uh, was Rabbi Emil Hirsch at Temple Sinai in Chicago. Hirsch preached a strong Jewish message similar to what Christians at the time were calling the social gospel. The idea that wealth brings responsibilities and must be shared in ways that don't just alleviate immediate need, but strengthen and empower others. And even before he became wealthy, Rosenwald was listening to Hirsch and donating um, to Sinai. And Hirsch introduced Rosenwald to Jane Addams. Next slide. Uh, she was the founder of Hull House, and, um, uh, which was a settlement house offering all kinds of services 
uh, English lessons, uh, job placement, childcare uh, to immigrants. And in 1902, Julius began making regular donations to Hull House and agreed to serve on its board. Again, thinking back to what Forbes said, um, he put his whole self into things. He didn't just give money. He agreed to serve on the board. He served on the finance committee. Um, so next slide, this is Richard Sears. And he and Julius Rosenwald were actually extremely different. Sears was a promoter of genius. One of his colleagues said he could sell a breath of air, but he was less concerned with the tedious business of processing orders and making sure people got the items that they were ordering in a timely way. So Rosenwald, as a new, as a new uh, uh, vice president of Sears, focused on management. In 1905, he took the lead role in creating a new plant for the company, one where operations could be consolidate, consolidated and made more efficient. You can change. Um, the enormous catalogs could be printed the, or, the merchandise assembled and processed and the orders filled and then sent out. There was a train station right next to the plant. So it was uh, an enormous undertaking. And like many huge projects, it ran over budget. So Julius Rosenwald turns to another one of his friends, next picture. This is um, Harry Goldman, Henry Goldman, who Julius had met when they were young men uh, in New York City. They lived in the same rooming house. And Goldman suggested that rather than make a loan to Sears Roebuck to cover the cost of their new plant, that he orchestrate a sale of public stock. And this was only the second initial public offering in American business history. And uh, it, it was phenomenally successful. And both Julius Rosenwald and Richard Sears became almost overnight extremely wealthy men. Next slide. This is Paul Sachs, also from the Goldman Sachs uh, families. And he influenced Rosenwald in a different way. In 1910, he gave Julius two books that he later said changed his life. One was a biography of a businessman called William uh, Baldwin, who was very involved in the YMCA movement and served on the board of Tuskegee. Um, but the other one, more relevant to our discussion tonight, was Up From Slavery. Next picture. Um, Up From Slavery, of course, was the memoir of Booker T. Washington, um, how he was born enslaved, grew up in Western Virginia, uh, managed to get educated at Hampton Institute in Tidewater, Virginia, now Hampton University, and how in 18, the 1880s, he had founded Tuskegee Institute in Alabama to train teachers. And next picture, by the, time, uh, by the time Rosenwald was reading about him, Washington was by far the most prominent, well-known and widely respected black American. So this book, Up From Slavery, particularly hit home with Rosenwald because he'd been thinking about the racial situation in the US in the wake of a particularly fierce riot that occurred in 1908 in his hometown in Springfield. And parallels with violence against Jews in Europe were not lost on him. And he began to understand support of African-Americans, uh, opportunity for African-Americans as a way he might make a significant contribution to the country. So when an opportunity arose for him to meet Booker T. Washington, he jumped at it. The two men met in May, 1911 and despite the fact that they were from very different backgrounds, very different experiences, they, they liked each other. And I think they, they recognized that they were in some ways rather similar kinds of people. They were both very pragmatic um, and each had kind of a domain that he was proud of. Uh, Rosenwald took Booker T. Washington to visit Sears and they had lunch in the executive dining room. And then Washington invited Rosenwald to come down and visit Tuskegee which in October of that year, October 1911, he did, filling a private train car with family, uh, his brother, his, his wife, his son, and with friends. Jane Adams came, Rabbi Hirsch came. The group, next picture, the group spent three days on the campus. 
Um, the Tuskegee campus, uh, as any of you who've been there know, it's beautiful. It was constructed by students out of, literally they made the bricks there. It's a very distinctive sort of rust, rust red colored bricks on the Tuskegee campus. Uh, they spent three days there. They were, next picture, um, very impressed with what they saw. The, the uh, visit ended with uh, a program in the chapel. This, this chapel sadly is no longer standing, but it was designed by Robert W. Taylor, uh, who taught architecture at Tuskegee and had been the first African-American graduate of MIT. Um, it ended with the singing of spirituals, which they had made something of a specialty at Tuskegee. And Rosenwald was very impressed and agreed to serve on the board of Tuskegee. Um, but he also engaged, next picture, he also engaged an ongoing relationship with, with, with Washington. They visited in each other's homes, they exchanged letters, and, and they engaged in a lot of conversation, not just about Tuskegee, but about what more might Rosenwald do that could be of assistance to the African-American community. And from Washington, he learned to appreciate the extraordinary hunger for education and the fact that in rural areas of the South, there were many places where there were literally no schools at all for African-American children. Public education was mandatory all over, but the states were dividing their money in the South. They were dividing their money very unequally between their black systems and their white systems. And what really appealed to Rosenwald was the fact that he learned from Washington that people in these small rural communities, people who were not wealthy at all, sharecroppers, ministers, uh, domestic workers were raising money to build schools. And just as they had banded together to provide churches for themselves, they were determined to have schools. So an initiative was launched to build six schools in the area around Tuskegee, next picture. Um, and uh, these schools were, half the money came from Rosenwald and half came from the community itself. Next one. Um, and uh, Rosenwald visited and was overwhelmed with, you can see in this picture, it's not just the, the students who are there, it's the whole community, turns out, uh, in gratitude and um, celebration of having a school. Uh, the initiative that was launched to build these six schools from this modest beginning became a program that between 1912 and 1932 built over 5,000 schools, shop buildings and teachers homes, next slide, in 15 states. It, this, is, this is just one of my favorite pictures. It's a one room schoolhouse in uh, East Texas called the Friendship School. Uh, it's estimated that in the years leading up to the Board of Education decision, one third of all the African-American children in the South, you can change the slide, got their early education in a Rosenwald school. Um, this is, a map showing the program uh, as it was at the end. Um, Rosenwald schools were definitely an example of what Edwin Embry, who ran the Rosenwald Fund uh, from 28 to 32, he called investment in people. And many of the men and women who came out of Rosenwald schools went on to further education, to significant careers, and to participation in the civil rights movement. Um, they also became involved in the preservation movement in the last 20 or so years. Change slide. Um, I like this picture. It's uh, a group of people who gathered to celebrate the reopening of the Ridgely Rosenwald School in Prince George's County, not far from here. And um, many, many of these women are members of the Deltas, a very powerful um, sorority. And you might have seen on the front page of the Washington Post last week an article about Angela also Brooke, who's the chief executive of um, Prince George's County. Um, she's also a Delta. And many of these women went to Rosenwald schools, taught at Rosenwald schools, um, and are just powerful women in their community. Um, but Rosenwald's investment in people went beyond the schools. In 1928, as he was handing over management of the fund to a professional, Edwin Embry, who he'd met when they both were served on the board of the Rockefeller Foundation, Rosenwald enthusiastically endorsed a new program to give individual fellowships to men and women of promise. And between 1928 and 1948, 
some 900 individuals received these grants, two thirds of them African-American, and an extraordinary number of them went on to highly significant careers. Next slide. Uh, the program had actually been the idea of Charles Johnson, who was a black sociologist who worked for the fund, and this man, James Weldon Johnson, who uh, had been the author of Lift Every Voice and Sing, <clears throat> often referred to as the Negro National Anthem, the Black National Anthem. He worked for the NAACP and uh, he and, and Charles Johnson put forward this idea of offering fellowships to individuals. Uh, he received one of the first fellowships as did singer Marian Anderson. And next slide, one of the first fellowships went to uh, this woman, Augusta Savage, who was a, a sculptor. She trained in France, many powerful works. Next slide, I guess I, next slide. Um, Langston Hughes, one of the stars of the Harlem Renaissance and just a major figure in American literature received several Rosenwald fellowships. Next picture, uh, Ralph Ellison. Uh, if you know anything about Ellison, you know that he was a slow worker. It took him a long time to write his masterpiece, Invisible Man, uh, but he was supported by the Rosenwald Fund while he was doing that. And Invisible Man is still standard on curriculum in many, many high schools. Uh, next picture, um, Elizabeth Catlett was a wonderful artist who taught for a time at Hampton, um, benefited from a Rosenwald fellowships, Fellowship. Now, not all the fellows uh, were well known uh, but their accomplishments firmly established their presence in many fields. Uh, next picture. Uh, you, you probably haven't heard of Mers Tate. She was from uh, Michigan, an extraordinarily gifted student who went on to become the first African-American to get a degree from Oxford University in England. And she became an expert in international relations and diplomacy. And for 30 years, she was a professor at Howard University. Next picture. Uh, this is another one of my favorites. This is the application picture in 1948, the last year of the fellowship program. Samuel Myers applied to the program so he could complete his PhD in economics at Harvard. He went on to a long career, worked in the Johnson administration for the Equal Employment Opportunity Office, later served as president of Bowie State University. Um, it was my privilege to meet him a couple of years ago uh, out at Collington, the uh, residential community where he lived. Um, he died last year at 100. Um, his son is also a prominent economist. Uh, he teaches at the University of um, uh, Minnesota. And just two weeks ago, his son had an op-ed in the New York Times about um, economic opportunity. Um, so a, a career, a far reaching career, in fact, his son, wrote an article about um, how the Rosenwald Fund was so helpful in promoting the first generation of black economists. Uh, next slide, uh, this you might recognize, this is Ralph Bunch, benefited from a Rosenwald Fellowship, Nobel Peace Prize in 1950. Next slide. Now you probably are gonna recognize the man on the right, but you might not recognize the person giving him the honorary degree. That was Horace Mann Bond, Rosenwald Fellow, scholar of American education, president of Lincoln University, which is granting this um, fellowship, and the father of civil rights leader, Julian Bond. Horace Mann Bond contributed to the NAACP Legal Defense Fund brief that Thurgood Marshall used in preparing Brown versus Board of Education arguments. Next picture. Also part of that argument, you may remember this, was the famous experiment by psychologists, Mamie Phipps Clark and Kenneth Clark well, they were both Rosenwald Fellows. And the experiment established how damaging segregation was to the self-esteem of African-American children. This photograph was taken by another Rosenwald Fellow, Gordon Parks. Mm -hmm. And finally, one of the last people to receive a Rosenwald Fellowship in 1948 was a young Jacob Lawrence who used his fellowship to rent studio space to put up 60 panels that he painted with the, that he painted to become the migration series. And you probably know this, many DC school children learn about the great migration with a visit to the Phillips collection where half these images reside and are on display. So 
I think you'll agree that this legacy is remarkable and de deserves to be more widely known. And for that, I will hand this over to Dorothy Cantor. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, hello. Can anyone yes. hear me? We yes. hear you just fine. Good. Loud and clear. Okay. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you to the Princeton Club of Washington. Uh, I have a relationship to the Princeton Club of Washington in the sense that my husband was a longtime member of the club and participated and contributed to it regularly. Um, you've heard from Stephanie about Julius Rosenwald, about his business acumen, about his philanthropy, his inspiring philanthropy. And so why are we interested in uh, creating a national park to honor Julius Rosenwald and the Rosenwald schools? Um, I uh, have been a volunteer for the National Parks Conservation Association for over 30 years. And I know quite a bit about national parks as I visited 320 of the units, but I did not know about Julius Rosenwald uh, until 2015 when I saw the uh, documentary Rosenwald. Debbie, do you have the slide you're ready to propel? Yes. Okay. So, um, so let me say why, first we'll go into why a, a national park. He contributed mightily to our American democracy, not only through his business, but particularly through his philanthropy. He was a high school dropout, but he believed very strongly in the value of education um, and its value to help people become full participating members of our democracy. As, as Stephanie said, he was the son of immigrants. And also he contributed mightily to this nation and which shows also the value of immigrants to our democracy. Um, and also none of the um, 420 plus national, specially nationally, excuse me, specially designated national park units uh, commemorate and preserve the story of a Jewish American and especially such a remarkable person. So it is time to rectify this. Um, do you have the slides up? I, I don't see them. Oh. Huh. Um, uh, but sure. but I, I will continue. Just pause, I'm gonna try again, hold on. Um, but I can continue. Please. So, so because I knew so much about national parks and I'd visit them and I knew that um, there wasn't that, um, okay, that's great. There wasn't one that celebrates the life and legacy of a Jewish American. Uh, I got involved to try to create this national park. And so why, um, let me say something about our national park system. It strives to tell the uniquely American story not just the stories of the amazing iconic natural wonders that bless our landscape, but the stories of the people who have in inhabited this land from the very beginning to those who are still making history. National parks preserve the American story, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Being able to do that is an important benefit of our democracy. So why a park now? Well, now is an especially important time to create a park to honor Julius Rosenwald and the Rosenwald schools. As we know, the country is at such odds with itself uh, where disunion and divisiveness are at a shrill level. This positive story of one man who learned from Booker T. Washington and other of the urgent needs of African-Americans and made such a difference to those around him needs to be told to help us all deal with the past so that we can heal. Julius Rosenwald's investment in people is still paying dividends, as you saw partially from Stephanie's presentation. The nation and the whole world should know such an inspiring story, especially now. And the best place of all to tell this story is in a national park. Next slide, please. So as I said, I first became aware of Julius Rosenwald through Aviva Kempner's film, Rosenwald. And Aviva Kempner is a local DC uh, filmmaker. Um, 
And then I decided because I knew about national parks, we should create a national park. So I saw the film in 2015, next slide. And in 2016, four people got together in the offices of the National Parks Conservation Association to plot a path forward. Two of the people were from the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Why were they involved? Well, every year they come out with a list of the 11 most endangered historic places. And in 2002, Rosenwald schools were listed on their, were included on their list. So two of the people are from the National Trust. And that listing led to the restoration of a number of schools and restorations are still underway in schools throughout the South. The other two people represented NPCA. And so from, uh, we met in 20, 2016 in July. And after that, we started creating a planning committee. One of the first people to join the planning committee was Stephanie Deutsch. Other people are people who are important people in National Park Service, including Bob Stanton, the first African-American director of the National Park Service. In fact, today I met him for lunch. Um, next slide, please. So in creating the National Park, we want to have it include a visitor center in Chicago where Julius Rosenwald lived, did his work and oversaw his philanthropy and a small collection of Rosenwald schools from among those that were built in 15 states in the South. You saw the map that, uh, of Stephanie showing how many schools there were in 1932. Next slide. So the first thing that we did was go out to the state historic preservation officers and ask them each to nominate up to five schools in their state. And in typical American way, we got some states that nominated one, some three, some five, and two that nominated six. Um, and, so, um, and so a total of 55 schools were nominated and one teacher home because the program built schools, shops, and teacher homes. And I'm gonna give you uh, a few examples of some of the schools that were nominated and that we visited between January January of 2018 and October of 2019. The first one is the K row. Yes, that's the way it's pronounced, Rosenwald School in Tennessee. Notice those windows, those nine over nine windows. That is emblematic of Rosenwald schools. They did not have electricity um, and nor did they have indoor plumbing. And this, there was sort of green design even before there was such a thing as green design. This is a one teacher school house it's been restored but you will notice one of the things that when we visited in 2018 that did need some um, um, maintenance on the exterior and that photo of Julius Rosenwald they do have uh, electricity now but no indoor plumbing the photo is the original photo in the school can I have the next slide please Stephanie showed you the photo of the deltas it was taken in the uh, Ridgely school in uh, outside Washington, DC. It's a two, it was originally a two teacher school to which another room was added in the forties. And when they restored it, they took one of the school rooms and uh, brought it back to the way it was during the era in which it served as a schoolhouse. Again, notice the big windows with bringing all the light into the room. The pot belly stove is not original, but all the schools did have pot belly stoves during the year in which they operated. Next slide. This, is, this was a school built in the Tuskegee area before all the plans were very standardized, which started in 1920. This is the San Domingo School in Sharptown, Maryland. It is a historically black community. The Quinton family is very important in this school. The parents uh, got very little formal education, but they were very, uh, decided that their children, all seven of them, would go to school and go to college. And they did. They, they all went to college. Two of them uh, at Morgan State uh, participated in civil rights protests against segregation. The Quinton Foundation is still running this school. It's a beautiful example of a restored school. Uh, Mr. Quinton is in his 70s. It's in a rural area. They're concerned that what's gonna happen after this generation is gone because the young people from this area are going to Baltimore, they're going to Washington. 
they're going to Annapolis. And in my mind, this would be a great um, example of a school that would go into a national park. But keep, let me just say that the decisions on which schools will go in and which will not will be made by the National Park Service. Um, next slide. This is, this is gonna be my last example. This was the Dunbar Junior High, Senior High and Junior College in Little Rock, Arkansas. It was one of the later schools built. The early ones were rural schools uh, and uh, one teacher, two teacher, three teacher. But in the late twenties, they started building big schools. This may be one of the biggest ever built. It was designed by the same architects who designed Little Rock Central High School. And the Little Rock Nine, who in 1957 integrated Central High School, a number of them went here before they transferred to Little Rock Central High School. It was a highly rated school in its day. Next slide. This slide shows uh, both uh, Dunbar and Little Rock Central High School. Both are still functioning schools. Uh, Dunbar needs a great deal of work, uh, HVAC, electrical system. As you can see, they were doing work because they're having leaks when we visited the school in 2018. Uh, I took the photo of uh, Little Rock Central High at the same time. Uh, it is a functioning high school, but it is also part of the National Park Service system. Uh, it is a National Historic Site. And interestingly, the visitor center across the street is the, the um, uh, gas station where the reporters all went to use the public phone to, to call in their stories about all the things that were going on in 1957 when Eisenhower had to call out the 101st Airborne to get that school integrated. So it is an example of separate and unequal. Next slide, please. Okay, so the next thing we did was we had a historic context study that was uh, prepared in October, 2018. That study is important because it concluded that Julius Rosenwald and the Rosenwald schools are of national historic significance and that they, a National Historical Park would be an important addition to the National uh, Park System. Historic significance is a very important thing when it comes to creating a national park. Next slide, please. Oh, okay, so um, last year on Lincoln's birthday, uh, I was out in uh, Springfield. This is an updated view of, of Rosenwald's boyhood home. Um, and, and during that uh, commemoration of Lincoln's birthday, a uh, historic marker was dedicated in front of uh, Rosenwald's home, um, the National Park Service, uh, the Rosenwald Park Campaign, and the Jewish Federation of Springfield helped to pay for that uh, marker. And importantly, the home, which prior to uh, fe February 12th, 2020, was called um, by a different name, it was, the name was changed to the Rosenwald House. Interestingly, Stephanie mentioned this, but the Rosenwald House is diagonally across the street from Lincoln's home. Uh, Julius Rosenwald never got to see Lincoln because he was born in, 19, in 1862. And Lincoln, what he saw was when Lincoln came, came back uh, after being assassinated in a coffin. Next slide. The campaign also, um, had a study performed in Chicago of sites that might be uh, candidates for a visitor center. It covers five sites. One I will point out because Stephanie did not mention this. The middle photo is of the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry. And Julius Rosenwald believed in challenge grants where he would put up some of the money and the other parties had to put up the rest. But in this case, for the Museum of Science and Industry, he put up the full amount and he insisted, insisted because he fought the city authorities that it not be named after him. Um, and so this is a report that we put out last year. Next slide, please. Most importantly, we were successful in getting legislation passed in 2020. The bill, bills were in, introduced in the House and the Senate in 2019 in the Senate by Senator Richard Durbin of uh, Illinois and in the House by uh, Congressman Danny Davis. And they went through the usual procedure uh, of having a hearing in the subcommittee level and the House bill passed the full committee. Well, that happened in March of 2020. 
Um, the Senate had a hearing, um, but no, nothing beyond that. And so we waited and we hoped that there would be an omnibus bill after the election. And we were told by um, the congressional staff that this wasn't gonna happen. And we were led to believe that there would be no law. And I was particularly saddened because one of the original co-sponsors in the house was Congressman John Lewis. And as you know, he passed away last summer. Um, but somehow, and it was a bipartisan bill. There were nine co-sponsors in the Senate and 43 co-sponsors in the house. Uh, and sometime in December, we got word that this bill, this small little bill, which is to tell the National Park Service to do a special resource study of the sites that are associated with the life and legacy of Julius Rosenwald. It does not, it did not create the National Park, but this little bill as a standalone bill passed the House on December 17th by a vote of 387 to five, and then it passed the Senate by unanimous consent. And on the very last day that it could be signed, January 13, 2021, uh, the president signed it and made it law. And we're working with the National Park Service now to get the special resource study started. And they've given us a commitment that it will start in October because there are other studies ahead of it. Um, but we're gonna be meeting with them in the summer. Um, and we are also, next slide. We're working on a report on Rosenwald schools, the ones that we've already visited, and I'll say a little more about that in a minute. Um, so one of the things we are doing right now is collecting Rosenwald memorabilia, and I'm going to give you three examples. Um, this is of Sears. Uh, we were able to buy a Stereopticon and slide deck, 50 slides. Uh, it was probably Richard Sears' idea because it came out shortly after the big uh, merchandising plant was um, uh, built and they got the funding from Goldman Sachs. It's a, it's a useful historical tool. There's, besides the photos, there's uh, information on the back of each slide. The very first slide, surprise, surprise, is photos of Richard Sears. And we're also collecting um, Sears postcards, vintage postcards. And I'll point to the middle slide uh, in terms of how Sears and Rosenwald in particular looked after his employees. That's a track that's a half a mile long by a block wide. And every year they had an annual track meet for the employees and it attracted about 20,000 people. Next slide, please. So Julius Rosenwald in his time was considered a pioneer of American industry. And there was a banquet back in October, 1928 that was billed as the billion dollar banquet. And nine people were uh, uh, recognized as pioneers of American industry, included were Or Orville Wright, Thomas Edison, Harvey Firestone, uh, Henry Ford, and Julius Rosenwald. And we have bought the newspaper, the New York Times vintage newspaper that shows a photo of the awardees. And also um, I took a photo from, this is the, the Museum of the City of New York, it's from the uh, banquet program listing and showing photos of the nine awardees. Next slide. Um, so as, as Stephanie said, JR was widely known and appreciated during his lifetime. And he died on January 6th, 1932. And the next day it was front page news and at least three newspapers and we've bought three of the newspapers in the, in the Chicago Daily Trib Tribune, that was his hometown. It was the banner headline. It was also front page news in the New York Times and in the New Orleans Times Picayune. He uh, donated money to Dillard University and HBCU in New Orleans. And one of his children, his daughter Edith and her husband, Edgar Stern were New Orleans natives and they were very active also in philanthropy and they followed in Rosenwald's footsteps uh, by also using the challenge grant as, as a way of getting philanthropy funded and getting people to have skin in the game. Next slide. Okay, so what are the next steps? I mentioned that we're working and I was working on that today uh, with the contractor a campaign and report on recommended Rosenwald schools. I mentioned the 55 schools and one um, uh, teacherage. 
and we have visited 33 of these facilities. Uh, I mentioned the National Park Service Special Resource Study, which we hope will be uh, completed sooner rather than later. When that is completed, we will go forward with the legislation to create, create the National Park. Uh, we are working on strategic planning and further organizational development for the campaign. Um, we have certain things in mind and we have uh, uh, potential of working with a very um, significant um, uh, architectural and design uh, nonprofit organization. And, and as I said, the last thing, the most important thing is the legislation to create the Julius, Rose, Julius Rosenwald and Rosenwald Schools National Historic Park. Next slide. Um, as you know, um, there is a national park for Rosie the Riveter out in California. It's a national historical park and we can do it. She did it. We can do it. Next slide. Next and last slide, please. So we have a website and this, uh, the, the historic context study, the study on the uh, sites in Chicago, and a lot of other things are on our, our website. I invite you to uh, visit our website at www.resinwallpark.org um, and also contact us at info at resinwallpark.org. We put out quarterly newsletters and campaign updates. Stephanie is the editor. We just had an update on April 15th and we're now working on the next newsletter. Uh, we would invite anybody who's interested to subscribe and get our newsletters and see, learn more about Julius Rosenwald the schools, the fellows, and what we are doing. So thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Great. Well, thank you to both of you. Um, I'd like to pose the first question or two and then open it up. I see from the time, it's about 10 minutes to nine. Uh, I wonder if we might get another five minutes uh, after that, if people can stick around. I'd like to give other people a chance to uh, ask and I will check out the chat shortly. Um, I have a question for Stephanie that you didn't uh, address in your presentation. Uh, how did you come to be one of the ones? I know there's a grandson who also uh, wrote a book about uh, Julius Rosenwald, but uh, we can focus on you. How did you uh, come to be the writer on behalf of the family and how does the family feel about uh, recent developments uh, of the movie yeah. and now the park in progress? Well, that's a really interesting question, uh, Debbie. Um, I was, gosh, it's 20 years ago now. I was sort of reinventing myself. Um, and my kids had gone to college and I had been taking writing workshops and I'd written several biographies that hadn't quite worked out. And one of my husband's cousins uh, suggested Julius Rosenwald. And my initial reaction was, oh gosh, a businessman? I don't know, that doesn't sound very interesting. Um, <laughs> and I have to say, it was not something that was ever talked about in David's family. I mean, it wasn't, uh, I think David, my husband probably knew the name Julius Rosenwald. He certainly knew there was a connection with Sears, but this whole story was not, not well known, not something that was talked about in the family. Um, but as you said, Debbie, there was a grandson of Julius Rosenwald who was working on a biography, a scholarly biography. And I called him up and he was incredibly gracious and he invited me to come see him in Chicago where he lives. And uh, we chatted a great deal and I started doing research and um, somewhere along the line, I came to the part of the story about Booker T. Washington and I just was hooked. I knew I'd found the subject that I was interested in. I'm not, you know, I wasn't going to write a business history because that wasn't really what I was interested. In. But when I got to the part about Booker T. Washington, I realized that this was a hugely significant American story with which I was not really very familiar. Uh, I was, I was actually shocked at my own ignorance and. So I was lucky that I was getting into the subject just as the National Trust was, as, as um, Dorothy said, the National Trust put the schools on the list of most endangered historic sites in 2002, just when I was starting to get interested. And 
so once I went to a Rosenwald school and met the alumni, uh, the story just had such uh, such power for me. I mean, it, it, it was still so powerful for people my age who had gone to the schools and it just, it just became very real. And so that, that's how I got involved and, um, and have continued to stay involved. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask another question that combines mine with uh, one in the audience who made a comment that uh, uh, in Oklahoma, there was a black school and a white school and the black school was actually a lot nicer than the white school. But of course, uh, there was segregation and we know that separate is not equal. So what, what can you tell us about the quality of education in those schools and perhaps from some of the former students and supporters of some of the Rosenwald schools that you've met in your visits, what is their uh, judgment of the quality of education they got at their Rosenwald? Well, uh, I'd just like to say about the school, the black school being better than the white school in that community. Uh, one thing the Rosenwald Fund was very aware of as they were planning these really state-of-the-art uh, schools um, was that they wanted to be careful that they not be, that they not appear to be better facilities than what the white kids had, because they knew that that would arouse hostility. And so there was kind of a little dance uh, around that. Um, another thing the Rosenwald Fund did was um, not in the earliest years, but as the program gained steam, they had standardized plans that they'd make available to anyone including white schools. And I visited a, um, a Rosenwald school in Southern Virginia. And as I was driving there, just over by the side of the road, I saw what looked exactly like a traditional Rosenwald school. And when I asked about it, I was told, oh, that was the white school. So there was some overlap. Um, in terms of the education, certainly the students at Rosenwald schools were very aware um, kind of of their second class status in terms of a story I heard over and over and over again was, we got the cast off textbooks. We got the old textbooks. And some of them, I mean, it's just hideous to think of this. Some of them had nasty things written in them. Um, but on the plus side, Rosenwald schools benefited from extraordinarily devoted teachers. Mm -hmm. And they benefited from extraordinarily cohesive communities Remember the communities had come together to build the schools. And in many of these small rural communities, especially you're going to school with your cousins and your sisters and your brothers, and you might know the teacher. At the Ridgely School, Mrs. Ridgely, who was in that picture, her first teacher was her aunt. And she told me, she said, I had to learn to call her Miss Green. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't call her Aunt Maggie. Um, uh, so the, the quality of the, the education was, um, the education was imparted by extraordinarily passionate and dedicated teachers. They had a standard public school curriculum. And I think that the students who came out of those schools, I mean, many, many who went to college, many, many who became teachers and doctors and, and served in the military and um, yeah. Separate is not equal, but separate in this case was extraordinarily powerful. Right. And, and also I remember at one of the schools, a number of the schools they had combined, like it was one to grades one to three in one room and grades four to six in another room. And um, one of the people we met with um, in, in, in Tennessee said, what we learned while we were doing our work, the other people were doing it and we got the benefit of hearing what was going on at the different grade levels and it was um, empowering. Um, and as Stephanie said, they did get hand-me-down books. A number of the schools, as she said, were, were close to churches. The churches had been uh, instrumental in getting the schools built. So um, there was a strong community involvement in the two teacher schools there were these doors that could be opened up. And so instead of being two rooms, it became one big room where it became a community center um, to have events there. So it was more, it was the school, but it was more than just the school. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Yeah. One more question and then I'll leave it for each of you to uh, say anything else you care to. Um, I stopped by the Ridgely School on Sunday on my way home from Southern Maryland and you showed a picture of it. You showed a picture of the former students and continuing supporters. Uh, how does one go visit there? Are you planning to arrange any group visits? It, it just strikes me as it could be a really interesting uh, way to go the next step, meet people to whom those schools uh, are living parts of their memory and community. Um, so yes, as a matter of fact, we had um, Stephanie interviewed one of our new board members, Curtis Valentine, who's very active in the education system. And we had the interview um, this Saturday after the election in November, but we were not allowed to go inside the building because of the pandemic. And the school is owned by the Prince George's County Division of the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. So to get in there, you have to make arrangements. And in normal times, which hopefully we'll be going back to soon, um, the Sigma uh, Delta, the Delta Theta, sorry, Delta Sigma Theta sorority alumni group helps run it. And so we would be working with them. So I agree with you, it'd be great to set up a visit. Um, as a matter of fact, we had a board meeting there. Uh, every year they have the celebration of Black History Month on the last Sunday in February. This year it was virtual. Um, and so, um, yeah, we're happy to see if we can work out uh, getting into the school, but it'll be dependent on when they open it up again. Okay. Great. Uh, any final thoughts, especially about those who would like to learn more to launch from this event to their own reading and viewing? Well, we'd be happy to set up other webinars because we wanna get the story out. I think it's a very um, remarkable story and we wanna get a national park created uh, I'm a very impatient person. I wish the park was created yesterday, but the more that we can get the story out, I think the more support we will get and the sooner the, the park will be created. So we appreciate the Princeton Club of Washington having this event tonight. Uh, and Debbie, I'd just add to that, that um, uh, so sign up for our newsletter because we're trying to each month we, or not each month, but each issue we cover some aspect of the Rosenwald story, and we do we do different things, but uh, it's it's interesting, and and um, there's there's so much to learn. <laughs> History is is uh, like unwinding a ball of yarn. The further you get, the, there's always more. So I'm constantly learning, and 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 constantly being uh, really inspired, not just by Rosenwald, but as I said, by by the people that were impacted by what he did. Right. Well, I want well, let to me say when, oh, please, Kimberly. Yeah, I just said, I want to thank you, Debbie and Stephanie and Dorothy for, uh, for bringing this program to us uh, tonight, for making the suggestion to the Princeton Club of Washington and for telling us uh, about some history that's right around us that we didn't probably most likely did not know about. Uh, so uh, just to reiterate, if you want to uh, sign up for the uh, newsletter, it is info at rosenwaldpark.org, and I'm sure they'd be happy to put you on the newsletter list. And uh, from the Princeton Club of Washington, if you missed the announcement at the beginning, um, I and certainly Dave St Steigman, who is the, um, uh, he was the chair of our membership committee for Princeton Club of Washington, would love to see you uh, become a member of the Princeton Club of Washington to support the many uh, programs like this one that, that we uh, offer, um, uh, well as uh, those who may be members the current members required, please do renew. So uh, again, we do thank you so much, all of you for joining us uh, for this very informative presentation. And if you have ideas, for uh, other presentations or even events, just like you were just talking about, Debbie, of hey, we can go on a tour and go visit some of these schools. That would be really interesting. 
Uh, if you have ideas for, uh, for events, either virtual or in person, uh, please do let us know uh, at, um, I think it's uh, PCW events at um, pcw.org. And that will get right to us, or you can go to our website, pc pcw-dc.org, and uh, you can just leave a message for us. Thank you so much uh, again, everyone, for participating this evening, and we hope to see you at a future PCW event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great everybody. presentation. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye.